All right, here we are. Philosophy of the paranormal. All right. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Excellent. All right. We are just going to wait until mm, 2.35, because that's when the class officially begins. And then we'll get started. Uh, probably a few more people will show up in the meantime. We'll just wait one more minute, according to the time I have on my computer. Um, okay. People will probably still keep arriving after um, we start anyway, but might as well hang on one more minute. All right, so 2.35. We may as well begin. So I will share my screen. Uh, this is how lectures are going to go for this class. Um, obviously, it's been indicated that uh, lectures will be online, but synchronous. So um, <clears throat> uh, for those that can't attend the live lecture, I will be uh, recording these and sharing them. Um, sharing them via my YouTube channel, which I'll tell you how to access in a moment. Uh, for now, let's just flip to the first slide where I indicate uh, the, the sort of plan for today, right? Um, what I want to do is review the course outline as a class, just so that we're all on the same page, uh, all uh, in understanding of what we're doing, uh, what our learning goals are and whatnot, and then we will get into the uh, introduction proper by just sort of uh, giving a quick overview of parapsychology and the paranormal. Obviously, since this is philosophy of the paranormal, the paranormal plays a sort of central role in um, all the discussions we'll be having. But parapsychology is an interesting, um, was an interesting attempt, I should say, uh, to examine some of these paranormal claims, paranormal events, abilities, whatever, uh, scientifically. It hasn't really worked out for parapsychology, as we'll see, um, but that's why we're talking about the both of them today. Um, I'll say a bit more about this after we go over the course outline. So let's go over the course outline together. Let's just bring it up here. My, actually, I can stay there. That's fine. So uh, I guess welcome, everyone. We're going to have our classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays. They'll be synchronous, but uh, you can access everything online after the class. Uh, this is my info, uh, my email info, if you want to get a hold of me. Um, and we have a teaching assistant uh, who's here today in the live lecture, I noticed, Jenna. So Jenna Fenwick, uh, Jenna's going to be our, your teaching assistant, and she's going to be helping me with evaluating your assignments and um, all of that fun stuff that TAs get to do. So that's the two of us. Um, let's see. So according to the course description, we'll be critically examining claims, concepts, and theories related to the paranormal. That is, phenomena which purportedly lie outside of the realm of everyday experience and or scientific explanation. Using an interdisciplinary approach, we will examine the scientific character of purported paranormal phenomena, 
In addition to their relation to philosophical questions surrounding human nature, thought, perception, and reality. Such phenomena will include those typically studied by parapsychologists, such as ESP, or extrasensory perception, telepathy, and psychokinesis. And from there, we'll move on to other phenomena that are sometimes categorized as paranormal, such as UFOs, astrology, dreams, so on and so forth. So that's why we're starting out with a bit of a survey of uh, not just what the paranormal is or how people regard it, what they think it is for those who believe in it, but also uh, how parapsychology got started, um, how it sort of tried and failed to become a science. Um, that's why we're starting off uh, with things like ESP, telepathy, and you know, characteristics, things that are characteristically known as uh, psi, PSI, psi phenomena. These are the things studied by parapsychology. But as we'll see today, while the term paranormal initially referred to um, what parapsychologists would call psi phenomena or what earlier psychical researchers in the 19th century and early 20th century would have called um, psychical phenomena, uh, the paranormal now refers to you know, a whole range of things that, that lie outside of either scientific explanation or everyday experience or both. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the motivation for, for starting where we're starting. And of course, there's no required textbook for this class. I actually provide all of the materials on Brightspace. Uh, usually these are readings. Sometimes they may be videos for you to watch and things like that. So uh, keep an eye out. All of those things will be, whoops, all of those things will be on the um, weekly modules on Brightspace, which I'm sure you're all uh, familiar with using by now. Uh, to access the course materials, uh, as I said, it's all on Brightspace. You'll find uh, everything you need there. Um, I'm recording these lectures, as I mentioned, and they'll be posted to my YouTube channel, usually later, later in the day, or maybe by the next day at the latest. And this is my YouTube channel here. So you can simply find that um, by clicking this link. Um, and all the videos will be there. So you can subscribe if you want, you don't have to. Um, but that's where all the recordings will be if you've missed something or if you want to review something. I also have a Discord server. And you can join that by clicking this link. Um, for those are, uh, who are not familiar, Discord is like a group chat uh, application. So uh, everybody can join up. This is the permalink right here. So you just click that. If you've downloaded the Discord app, then you should be able to click that and join the server, no problem. And I've already got a sort of um, channel, a sort of sub channel on there for philosophy of the paranormal, if I'm not mistaken. Um, if, I, if I am mistaken, then I'll have that done after this lecture. Uh, so this is a good resource for you to sort of communicate amongst yourselves, sort of chit chat about what we're learning. Um, if anyone needs to ask questions, this is like the fastest way to get a hold of me probably. Uh, and you can, you can sort of talk shop amongst yourselves if you want to sort of read over each other's work uh, to sort of uh, you know get some teamwork going, some editing, some revising when it comes to like your essay assignment or something, this is a great way to do that. So everybody should uh, hop on that Discord server. I also do office hours via the Discord server because of COVID stuff and all of that. So, uh, and don't be shy. I like it when students reach out and get engaged. Uh, that's good to see. So here's a little breakdown of uh, the sorts of assignments you'll have in this class. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about the quizzes, the essay proposal, and the final essay in, the, in a moment. But importantly, uh, this table gives all of your due dates, um, the weight of your grades. So all your quizzes are going to be worth 10%, your essay topic proposal 15, final essay 45 for a total of 100%. Uh, I'll go into detail in a moment. But that's just a handy dandy table where you can sort of review everything you like. Uh, if, if you forget when something's due, it's all there. And this is our lecture schedule, of course. 
So today, parapsychology and the paranormal, after we're done with this brief uh, overview of the course outline. For Thursday's lecture, we're going to talk about the uncanny. Why do I do this? Um, the uncanny isn't strictly speaking paranormal or supernatural, but things that are uncanny, uncanny persons, uncanny situations, uncanny beings are kind of weird and creepy. Uh, and I think that the uncanny or discussion of uh, uncanniness is, uh, is good for two things in this class. It's good for uh, getting us to talk about some of the emotional responses we may feel in the presence of these sort of uh, paranormal or, if you like, anomalous phenomena. You know, if we have an anomalous experience, um, it may also uh, seem to us to be quite uncanny. And when we get into these lectures, you will see why. Um, so that's one and two. We're going to be reading a, a, a fun paper by Ernst Jentsch, old-timey psychologist from the early, 19, uh, early 20th century, sorry. We're going to read a short story. Um, one of E.T.A. Hoffman's night pieces. Um, Hoffman was uh, a writer of horror, um, and he has this story called The Sandman, which Jentsch references in his paper, and which Sigmund Freud also discusses in his work on The Uncanny, which we'll read in lecture two. And it's just a great story. It's very, um, it's creepy, you know? It's the kind of story where uh, I encourage students to uh, cozy up in a chair, maybe light some candles, um, you know, make it kind of spooky and, and just read that story and, you know, get a sense of the uncanny. So then in lecture four, we'll return to parapsychology. Um, oh, I almost forgot. That's one reason why uh, the emotional side of things is one reason why it's good to talk about the uncanny. Another reason is because uncanny persons, things, objects, situations often seem to involve animacy, perceptions of animacy, uh, misperceiving something to be alive when it's not. For example, this is why corpses are thought of as uncanny. Um, they were so recently alive. So if you've ever been to an open casket funeral and you've seen a body, you'll, you might find it looks a little weird. Um, this person who you've known as alive is there lifeless, uh, but they're made up to look as if they're just sleeping or something. It's very uncanny. Um, or similarly with robots, right? A lot of people have probably heard of the uncanny valley. Why are robots uncanny? Well, one reason. Um, is because they're inanimate objects that are imbued with these um, mental functions and bodily functions. Um, so they can seem a little bit weird. And animacy and uh, perceptions of animacy and mentation, I think, also have a lot to do with anomalous experiences that people attribute to the paranormal. Uh, and we'll see this when we get into ghosts and and that kind of thing, right? Start talking about ghosts. So that's another reason why we talk about the uncanny. Okay, and then lecture four, back to uh, parapsychology, where we'll talk about um, psi abilities, extrasensory perception and psychokinesis. We'll talk about how these have been studied um, and how the research program of parapsychology kind of rose and, fall, uh, rose and fell in the 20th century. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about this today too, but we're not going to get into it in great detail. Uh, I'm just going to sort of give you the, the whistle stop tour of parapsychology. Uh, lecture five is fun. Uh, we're going to do mediumship, ghost hunting, and communicating with the dead. Now, um, previous classes, my lecture focused solely on mediumship and communication with the dead because this was uh, what kicked off the spiritualist movement in the United States in the 19th century, and this eventually spread to Europe. <clears throat> Mediumship is communication with the dead. Um, in the 19th century, you would have these spirit mediums. You've probably heard of spirit mediums. There are still spirit mediums or still people who claim to be spirit mediums on television, um, on the internet right? We've got like, uh, you know, the Long Island medium 
type character. I, I don't know her name. Is it Teresa Caputo? That might be her name. I don't know. But uh, we still have these figures. Um, but this is the sort of thing that actually kicked off all of this stuff, at least in the modern world. Uh, it was all due to the Fox sisters who um, claimed to communicate with the spirit of a dead person who had lived in their house um, by receiving these mediumistic raps, like knocking sounds, right? Uh, they later confessed to fraud. They had produced the raps by cracking their knuckles and their toes against their bed. Um, uh, and, uh, and even after their confession, people still continued to believe in spirit mediums and, and, and it, it all just kind of blew up and led to uh, eventually so, uh, the, the Society for Psychical Research and, and eventually after a few more decades, uh, parapsychology. So I decided this time I'd like to throw a little bit about ghost hunting in there because uh, that's just a really interesting uh, a really interesting way in which you can see how perceptions of animacy and mentation can figure into anomalous experiences, uh, like if you believe you've encountered a ghost. Um, it's also a really good exercise in seeing how pseudoscience works. Uh, I'm not sure, this show hasn't been on the air for a while, but there's probably, there's probably some clone of it out there now that I'm not aware of, but uh what was it called i think it might have just been called ghost hunters anyway it, it featured plumbers they were plumbers like actual plumbers and and they drove around in a van hunting for ghosts um i always thought that was hilarious uh but they'd go and like you know they'll do things like record background noise um uh and listen to it for voices Right. And you play it back and, oh, I heard this strange voice and, you know, this kind of thing. Or they'll use like um, these electrometers to measure uh, electrical readings in uh, in the air or something or, or taking pictures of the digital cameras and seeing orbs and floaters and weird things. Uh, this is interesting to me because they don't use any of those scientific tools the way that they're actually meant to be used, nor do they apply any kind of scientific method. Right. I mean, it's a show for entertainment. Um, nonetheless, a lot of people take it seriously. And I thought it would be interesting to, fun, to, to throw a little ghost hunting in there um, just, to, just to critically assess it. Uh, after that, we'll have cryptozoology. Um, I actually don't have this planned out yet, but I'd like to make it Canadian cryptozoology. I did a, a very brief lecture once on the Ogopogo, for example, which is a uh, believed to be a, a sort of Loch Ness monster type of creature uh, that lives in, in a lake in British Columbia. And it's drawn from the folklore of the First Nations that live in the area. Uh, so there'll be some interesting uh, opportunities to discuss um, how uh, folklore uh, particularly folklore from indigenous people sort of gets appropriated and, and often used for uh, tourism purposes, really. Um, of course, there are purported sightings of this creature, but um, those can be explained easily by logs, debris, um, perhaps other large creatures that live in the water. Um, yeah, the interesting thing about this to me is is um, is really how um, the belief in the uh, spirit of the Ogopogo among the native peoples there, and and I gotta emphasize spirit, uh, non corporeal. Often these these uh, cryptids they're called uh, sort of get appropriated out of folklore and. Uh, discuss as if they're an actual creature that's out there. But oftentimes, you know, your, your Ogopogo, Sasquatch, the, the Chupacabra um, are not, at least initially, believed to be physical beings wandering around. They're, they're sort of like spiritual beings, right? They're not corporeal, um, at least in their original folkloric context. And then they sort of get taken out and, oh, let's go 
find a Sasquatch. Sasquatches are walking around somewhere. No, they're not. Um, and, and, and the native peoples probably didn't really think that they were physically out there. They were like a spirit, not, a, not an animal, right? So that's why I think cryptozoology is interesting to discuss. Uh, astrology and horoscopes in week four, this is a fun one. Uh, this is probably one of the most widely believed um, examples of uh, paranormal phenomena. And there are um, astrology apps now. Um, horoscopes are still printed in all of the major newspapers. But very few people understand how astrology and horoscopes is actually supposed to work. So in this lecture, we explain uh, sort of the idea behind this. It's actually a form of divination. So astrology is, is, is a form of divining personal information about you from a horoscope. And a horoscope is, uh, properly speaking, not the thing you read in a newspaper, you know, like, oh, Virgo, you will have an unexpected uh, bout of good luck today. That's not a horoscope. A horoscope is a detailed star chart um, that indicates where the stars, planets, the sun and the moon, all that stuff was where you were born. And then it is believed by astrologers that you can divine information about a person uh, from this. Can you really? Well, we'll see. Uh, then my favorite, aliens and UFOs. You know, out of all of the anomalistic or paranormal phenomena that we're going to cover, this is the one uh, that I think is plausible, right? Uh, so we'll talk about the Drake equation, for example. The sheer size of the universe um, and the sheer time scales involved mean that it would be a statistical absurdity if we were alone in the universe. However, does that mean that UFOs are alien spaceships visiting Earth? Well, I think we have to be a little bit more skeptical about that. It's not to say that it can't happen or hasn't happened. I would love it if it happened. That would be so cool to know that, uh, you know, there's life in the universe and it's not just like bacteria growing on Europa or something, uh, or, or some kind of fossils on Mars, I don't know, but, but an intelligence, that would be pretty neat. But is there evidence for this? I don't know. I don't think so. But you decide for yourself. One of the things that we do here that's really fun is we talk about um, famous cases of UFO uh, encounters. So, so like, for example, the Hill abduction case, a very famous a uh, very famous purported case of abduction from Benny and Barney Hill, who uh, collectively lost time on a road trip. They were coming uh, back to the United States from Canada. Uh, and later under hypnosis, they recalled this experience of being abducted by aliens and taken into their ship. Did it really happen? Well, there are some reasons to question their account. Um, certainly, but we'll talk about that. And we will also talk about uh, the report on unidentified aerial phenomena or UAPs that was declassified recently by the Pentagon in the United States. I did this last time and it was a lot of fun. It's actually not that long and really does not say a whole lot, which is fun. So let's, let's enjoy this. It's going to be fun to read about it and talk about it. It's going to be great. And week five, we'll talk about dreams and dreaming. Another, um, Another interesting area for me, because dreams have um, throughout history been associated with the supernatural, which is, of course, uh, I think there's some significant overlap between supernatural things and paranormal things. Uh, and dreams have been uh, regarded as a source of prophecy, a source of knowledge, uh, wisdom, um, they're certainly very strange. People claim to have uh, uh, precognitive dreams, for example. They'll dream about something and then it comes true. How do we evaluate those claims? Um, and particularly a very interesting kind of dream that was once regarded by science as impossible. I'm talking here about lucid dreams. Lucid dreams were once the province of parapsychology. Um, in fact, there, uh, so for those who are not familiar, a lucid dream is a dream that you have during which you know you are dreaming. 
In the 1950s and 60s, a lot of scientists thought this was absurd because they regarded dreaming as unconscious. And when you're aware, you're conscious. How can you be conscious and unconscious at the same time, right? That's the, uh, that was the gripe that a lot of scientists and philosophers had. And a psychophysiologist uh, named Stephen Leverge and a parapsychologist named Keith Hearn independently established that they were in fact real by having dreamers uh, make these eye movement signals while they were asleep and having the dream and carrying out little experiments while they were asleep, like counting to 10 in a dream and seeing how long it takes and, you know, fun stuff like that. And I like to throw this in there just because um, it's, a, it's kind of a neat example of uh, once we understand something, it's not really paranormal anymore. You know, now lucid dreams are um, accepted as uh, a, a real phenomenon and, and many people experience them. Maybe you've had one yourself. So that's an interesting idea of how when something paranormal gets figured out, it's not paranormal anymore. So that's why I put that in there. And then in that same vein, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, out-of-body experiences, astral projection, and reality shifting. So we'll do that on week 10. Out-of-body experiences are what they sound like. They are when you have an experience of leaving your body. Sometimes this happens um, when we're falling asleep or waking up. It can also be associated with uh, the old hag phenomenon or sleep paralysis, um, which, by the way, is also probably connected to many cases of uh, UFO abduction, as we'll see. Astral projection is a similar idea, except the idea is, is that you're going into different dimensions. Uh, do people really go into different dimensions when they do this? Well, um, I'm skeptical myself. Uh, but it'll be interesting to take a look at. And lastly, I want to include reality shifting. This is a TikTok trend that came to my attention a while ago. Um, and also, it'll give us an interesting opportunity to talk about something that um, uh, a student in one of the previous iterations of this class brought to my attention, and that's the Mandela effect, the sort of false memory phenomenon uh, that some explain by positing that, uh, well, they're not misremembering, they're remembering things correctly, it's just they've uh, accidentally hopped timelines uh, somehow, or shifted realities somehow. So that'll be fun to talk about. Um, so that's, 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 that's good. Yeah, reality shifting. Uh, that was trending on Twitter last night, actually, not reality shifting. But what was it? It was because um, they're, they're restarting the Large Hadron Collider in um at cern in switzerland um you know it's this big particle accelerator they smash particles together and they break apart into you know quarks and whatnot and they can see what the universe is made of it's how they prove the existence of the higgs boson maybe you remember that from a few years well that's like a decade ago now but anyway uh there's a lot of conspiracy theories surrounding cern uh, you know, that uh, maybe they've, uh, you know, uh, and, and a lot of this is joking hyperbole, and some of it is people who actually believe it, but it was fun scrolling through those treat tweets like, oh, you know, uh, CERN's going to cause us to shift timelines again or something when they, when they fire up the Large Hadron Collider, who knows. So that'll be fun to talk about. As we get toward the end of the class in week six, we're going to start wrapping things up by talking about anomalistic psychology, which I see as um, a, a pretty good replacement for parapsychology. Anomalistic psychology um, says, OK, sure, you've had an anomalous experience. So if I believe I've encountered a ghost or had a dream about the future. OK, that's an anomalous experience. It doesn't it doesn't say, oh, it's paranormal. It's beyond the laws of nature or something. No, uh, rather, it tries to explain these experiences using the tools of naturalism. So this is the same scientific toolbox that all of the other scientists draw from, all of the other sciences, I should say. So we'll read an interesting paper on that. And then for the last two lectures, I thought it would be cool to do things kind of like uh, seminar style. So we'll have one where we discuss the importance of skepticism. And we'll have another one we talk about the ethics of belief. Um, is it okay to believe in things that you don't have evidence of? 
and the ethics of changing beliefs. If I'm aiming to make you all more skeptical and critical of the paranormal, is that okay? And we'll have a discussion about that, so. Right, uh, quizzes. Um, so there's going to be four. Um, they're all going to be online over Brightspace and you can consider them open book. What they are is to sort of um, help you assimilate these key concepts and terms that you're going to be picking up. Um, so feel free to use any notes, lecture notes of my lecture slides, whatever. They're all open book. It's all fine. But I do recommend that you study before you begin. You'll have a, a window of a few days to start the quiz. And then once you begin the quiz, you will have 30 minutes to finish it. But the quizzes are not difficult. Like they've got multiple choice questions, true, false, maybe some fill in the blank questions. They are just designed, as I said, to help you sort of assimilate and retain um, the key concepts that you'll be learning here. Uh, and each of those is worth 10%. Um, you also have an essay topic proposal and a final essay. So the final essay, excuse me, works as um, a take home examination. And so it's due on the last day of the exam period. So that's August 25th uh, at one minute to midnight. Uh, and there will be a Dropbox on Brightspace where you can submit it. Uh, what you need to do for this paper is present an original argument or some original research on a topic of your choosing. And it just has to be related to the themes of this class. Um, I expect the papers to be well written. They need to cite everything properly. So you need to have um, a proper references section. And you're going to be aiming for 2,000 to 2,500 words in length, excluding any title page or reference pages. And this is worth the most. Uh, out of this class, 45% of your final grade. I will, of course, provide more detailed instructions on this as the due date approaches. Uh, one of the things I will tell you now, though, is that you'll have to propose a topic for your essay. So you're going to write a 500 to 750 word uh, proposal where you will state the topic of your research uh, paper. Um, you'll tell me what you want to argue. Um, you can include a preliminary uh, bibliography, and this way I can get you all feedback. Uh, well, not just me, uh, Jenna and myself can get you feedback before you go ahead and write the paper, right? So the paper uh, proposal is worth 15% of your final grade, and it'll be due on July 29th. Again, I'll provide more detailed instructions. Probably what I'll do is I will either make a video containing the instructions, or um, I'll refer you to uh, a couple of the previous videos that I've done for this class. Um, see, I used to uh, just do completely pre-recorded asynchronous lectures. This is the first time I'm doing this live. Uh, so I have a few uh, videos from my old class that already detail the essay assignment. Ignore the due dates and, and, and stuff in those videos if you watch those, but pay attention to the actual instructions that I give. Those would be the key, the key points, the key takeaways. Uh, a note on these submissions, both of these must be submitted in either doc or PDF format. So Microsoft Word or uh, Google Docs, I believe, does this, or you can do PDF. I cannot open other file formats, so I won't grade them. Um, and, 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 and there's a lot of students in this class. I know there are only 20 or so people here now, but there are more than that. And I, I don't, I, I just won't have the time to like bug people to like submit the proper thing. So make sure it's in MS Word or in PDF if you can't do that couple of other important things. Um, deferral policy, I tend to be a little bit relaxed on this. And I think um, that's been university policy throughout the pandemic. We're using fair and compassionate grading guidelines, uh, a fair and compassionate assignment policies. So uh, if you're ill, or if you're suffering a bereavement, uh, you can definitely contact me. But I also like to make room for extracurricular stuff. So I don't know, maybe you're um, playing in the chess tournament or something, I don't know, and you can't do the quiz, fine, I'll work with you. Um, if you're sick or if you're uh, not sick, but you have uh, some kind of other medical thing going on, um, 
let me know. Uh, religious obligations, pregnancy obligations, all these things. You you got to do what you got to do. No problem. You got to if you've got to um, if you have a religious holiday that you have to observe, fine. If you are um, you know uh, if you're about to go into labor, obviously fine. Uh, all good. I tend to be pretty accommodating as long as students let me know what is going on and work with me. I'll work with you if you work with me. But if I don't hear from you, I'm not going to chase after you. And this is all pretty standard down here. These are the letter grades that we'll be using. I give grades uh, for your assignments in, in uh, numerical grades, but your final grades will be letter grades. And everybody should aim for the A range, obviously. It's difficult to get an A plus in this class, but it's easier than some classes, I would say. Uh, right, uh, academic accommodations. Um, I'll let you guys all look over this uh, on your own time, but this is just all of the important policies. Um, if you need any deferrals for either term work or for the final exam, maybe you get sick and you can't finish your essay. Well, you're going to want to apply for a deferred final exam. That will allow you to complete it later. Definitely look over the plagiarism uh, section. You want to avoid plagiarism at all costs. I'll go over this um, when I discuss the essay assignment, um, but you do want to be very careful of plagiarism. Here's where you have information about pregnancy or religious obligations. Like I mentioned earlier, if you're uh, pregnant or if there's a religious holiday you need to observe, uh, need to observe, uh, no problem. Just uh, keep me in the loop so that if you're going to miss an assignment, we can come up with an alternate day for you to submit it. Uh, academic accommodations for students with disabilities. Of course, this is very important. If you have a uh, disability or learning difference, um, you can coordinate with the Paul Menton Center. And uh, they'll uh, give me a letter that will detail your uh, accommodations. And I will see that all those accommodations are upheld. I, uh, I, I understand that, um, you know, there are lots of different learning styles, lots of different ways to learn out there. And I myself am a bit of a, um, um, a bit of a different learner, a bit of a different teacher. So, um, you know, I'm happy to work with you if necessary. Also see survivors of sexual violence. Uh, definitely, um, this, is, this is somewhat new, but I think very important. Uh, any kind of, uh, I, I mean, any kind of violence, but if you're a survivor of uh, sexual violence and uh, you need to take advantage of support, there is information there that you can follow. And then this is the extracurricular stuff, accommodation for student activities. You know, you, you gotta go play a, uh, the sports game or, chess match or go to a conference or uh, a seminar, anything, let me know. I'm pretty good about working with students um, when it comes to this stuff. All right, so that's it for the course outline. Let's just uh, get rid of this. And we'll go full screen for our slideshow. My computer is slow, but there's not much I can do about that. All right. No. Well, there we go. Where are all the letters? There. Oh, it's one of these weird slides. <laughs> okay. Before we get into the actual material, uh, I'll just say that although the classes are scheduled for about three hours. Um, I doubt we'll go that long today. And I, 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 whether we go that long in uh, future lectures will really depend on how much discussion there is. Um, because there's no textbook for this class, um, some lectures uh, involve a lot of readings and maybe we can get into a lot of discussion. And some lectures don't involve very much readings at all. Um, and as a result, maybe they will not generate quite as much discussion. Um, so we'll see. Basically, it's going to be a kind of flexible sort of thing. But if we if we do have a longer lecture, you know, if we're pushing three hours and you need to just get up, 
uh, use the bathroom, get a drink or something, just, just do it, right? We're on Zoom, so you can just uh, turn your camera off and get up and leave, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> any questions before we get into the material? You can offer them either via video or via the chat. All right. So I guess we'll get started. So we've reviewed the course outline. Now I want to discuss what we mean by the word paranormal. Uh, we'll discuss parapsychology, and this is all to get us oriented uh, for the remainder of the class. A few uh, housekeeping things. I think this slide is a, a, an artifact of when I uh, would uh, teach this class asynchronously, but I certainly recommend you take notes, uh, even you know now that we're doing it synchronously. I try to have the lecture slides available uh, before the class begins, which means that you can print them out and then you can simply write your own notes on them, or you can take notes on your device, right? Um, maybe you have a computer or a smart, well, you, you must have a computer or a smartphone if you're watching this, or a notebook, you know, you can do it old school. I still like writing on paper. Um, paper's great. Um, I uh, Staring at a screen all day, you know, it's hard on the eyes, right? So uh, nothing wrong with a good old fashioned notebook. Um, if there are extra videos I share, for example, I may share some later today in the Discord server, you might want to take notes of those uh, if you see something interesting. And you can even make notes in the margins of the reading if you're printing the readings out and reading them ahead of time. That's very helpful. Uh, but I hope somebody's taking notes because we also need a volunteer note taker for this class. Uh, this is a message from the Paul Menton Center for Students with Disabilities that I will share. They are seeking a volunteer note taker for this class, which is Phil 2405A. The volunteer role is very easy for you to do, and volunteers who successfully fulfill the requirements of the role are eligible to receive a letter of appreciation and a CCR credit at the end of the semester. That's uh, co curricular record credit. It's kind of like a transcript for volunteer service. So, and it's good to have if. Um, you know, if you're applying to graduate school, for example, or, or if that's something you're thinking of doing, uh, volunteer stuff looks good. Uh, it looks good on scholarship applications. It's good when you get out into the workforce and you can say that, well, not only did I get really good grades, I also volunteered and I helped people. That looks good too. And it's, it just is good. You'd be doing a good thing, right? So, so that's good. Uh, what you have to do is take notes for all lectures and have them uploaded within 48 hours of the lecture date. Notes can be typed and uploaded directly using your personal computer, or handwritten notes can be scanned and uploaded via Carleton Central. If you are doing handwritten notes or if you're volunteering for that, um, you know, you want to make sure your handwriting is nice. I have this weird thing where if I'm writing with a pen, it, it's like really chicken scratch, but if I'm writing with a pencil, looks great i don't know why um but you know keep little things like that in mind if you're taking handwritten notes if any of you are interested you can email volunteer underscore note taking at carlton.ca just give them your name student number complete course code including this section so that's this um if you want to take uh, a look at their fac uh just follow this uh link their volunteer note taker fac uh, or FAQ. I guess it sounds weird saying FAQ. So um, FAQ. Go to the FAQ. All right. So in this class, as described in the course outline, I better shrink myself here. Uh, we will critically, critically examine claims, concepts, and theories related to the paranormal. As we'll see, the parano uh, paranormal phenomena are, uh, or I prefer to call them anomalous phenomena, but paranormal phenomena are, are phenomena that lie outside of the realm of everyday experience or scientific explanation or both. And of course, we're going to be using an interdisciplinary approach here. We're not just doing philosophy. We're also going to be looking at some psychological stuff, uh, some stuff from some of the other cognitive sciences. We'll be looking at literature, um, 
we may be watching uh, videos, um, all in with the end of examining the scientific character of purported paranormal phenomena and their relation to philosophical questions surrounding human nature, thought, perception, and reality. Oh, excuse me. So that means we will be taking a critical approach, a skeptical approach. First of all, why? Um, and here's where I'm going to start sort of kicking the ball to you guys. Um, I, I should say this right away. I've been, I've been meaning to say this for a bit. Uh, we have 30 people here now. Uh, we have more in the class who will probably watch later. And I am certain that we have uh, some people in this class who are the most ardent skeptics you'll ever meet. And we probably have others in the class who are believers in the paranormal. Um, so it might seem like a bit of a downer when you get here, if you are somebody who believes in the paranormal and your professor says, we're going to be skeptical and critical and rah, 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 right? That probably sounds like a bit of a bummer, but, um, that does not mean we're going to be, um, me, right? Um, the thing is I want everybody to treat this class as a safe space for the ideas that we will be considering and for yourselves, right? So we're not gonna, uh, we're gonna be respectful of other people's beliefs and we're going to undertake this learning journey together. So skeptics have gotta be nice to the believers. The believers have gotta be nice to the skeptics. I myself am a skeptic, but I'm not a skeptic in the sense that, oh, all of this is just wrong. Uh, I'm a skeptic because I believe that in order to arrive at the truth, you need to apply doubt. Um, and this is, this is huge in philosophy, right? This is philosophy of the paranormal. If we weren't treating these claims skeptically, we would not be doing philosophy. Critically examining these claims too. Well, so if skepticism means to doubt, um, then what does it mean to critique or critically examine? Um, well, it means to ask questions, right? So that's why, uh, that's why, uh, again, same, the same, same goes for the importance of skepticism. The importance of being critical means that we need to ask questions. It's very important to ask questions of the claims that we'll be considering because they actually, some of these phenomena would have big implications for, uh, questions that surround human nature. Uh, one example that we'll see after we talk about the uncanny and we get back into um, ESP and psychokinesis is the implications that uh, this would have for physics, right? If people could communicate thoughts um, in an extrasensory motor manner, you know, not talking, but just like this, like beaming our thoughts into another person's brain, or if we could move objects with a thought, what would that mean for physics? We would have to completely reevaluate all of physics, right? So um, what would it mean for free will if um, precognition were true, right? If it were true that there were individuals who could predict the future or see the future, well, what does that mean for free will? Sounds like we might not have it, right? Because it sounds like the future's determined and someone has access to it and they can tell you what's going to happen, right? So that's why it's very important to be critical and skeptical. Uh, but it doesn't mean to be me, right? And another reason I say this is because a lot of paranormal beliefs overlap with um, folklore and religion. And these can be very important to some people, right? Um, <clears throat> so... So it's important that we be critical and skeptical, but at the same time, respectful. And that's what we will try to do in this class. All right, so what does it mean? Phenomena that lie outside of the realm of everyday experience or scientific explanation. Well, when it comes to everyday experience, and this is, a lot of this is my own, my own sort of thinking on the matter. The paranormal has got to be unusual, right? Whatever paranormal phenomenon we're talking about, it's gotta be something out of the ordinary. 
maybe so out of the ordinary that it's something that we've only heard stories about, but that we haven't encountered ourselves. So you might be thinking here about ghost stories, right? You may uh, never have seen a ghost or what you believe to be a ghost, but you've probably heard stories. You've probably heard tales of encounters with aliens, right? Probably uh, you've heard about some weird unexplained events. Maybe uh, if something like this hasn't happened to you, you may know a friend or family member who claims to have encountered something like this that was just so far out of their everyday experience that um, you know they couldn't explain it. Uh, they couldn't explain it naturalistically in any case. Um, as we keep going throughout this class, we will see that emphasis is often placed on uh, the mystery, the, the enigmaticness, the, the enigmaticness, the strangeness, the, the, the way that these things are out of place. Um, and this is why I, I will begin discussing the uncanny next time is because that is, you know, that's kind of what, what the paranormal and the uncanny have in common. They're weird and strange and kind of frightening for that reason. So, you know, uh, it's not just an unusual occurrence. Um, it's got to be kind of mysterious. I mean, an unusual occurrence would be like if I went to the International Space Station, right? Um, that would be unusual. Maybe I win a contest. I don't know. I get the golden ticket and Jeff Bezos is going to send me to space. And um, that's unusual, but uh, it's not really paranormal, right? It's just like, oh, that's, that's weird. That's unusual. Never thought I'd go to space, but I'm going to go to space. Uh, or if you were to like visit the North Pole or, you know, what was something unusual that I saw recently? I'm trying to think something unusual that's not paranormal. Well, I can't think of anything. I guess my life is not that exciting, but you get the idea. There are, um, there are things that are out of the ordinary, and then there are things that are out of the ordinary in that they sort of violate our experience of what the world is supposed to be like. Those are the sorts of things that we would call paranormal now. What about scientific explanation? In what sense does the paranormal uh, sort of lie outside of the realm of scientific explanation. Well, one way would be that science just has not yet explained the phenomenon in question, right? And this is, uh, this is kind of the story of parapsychology, right? Um, parapsychology was aimed at uh, understanding psi phenomena. So we're talking extrasensory perception, uh, telepathy, psychokinesis, uh, these kinds of things. It was believed that, um, and this is coming out of the tradition of psychical research, which we'll talk a little bit about in, the more, in a moment. It was believed that these abilities may have represented a future direction of human evolution, you know, but that science just didn't have the tools to study them. It turns out that when we um, take a look, uh, what we find is either nothing at all, or unfortunately, we find cases of fraud. And we'll look at one today, uh, later on in this lecture. So maybe, uh, maybe there are just phenomena that science uh, cannot yet explain, right, but we think of as paranormal or supernatural. Uh, what's a good example? Well, uh, we wouldn't think of this as paranormal or supernatural now, but think of lightning, right? Uh, lightning in the distant past was associated with the gods, right? Or God. Um, I mean, think about it. Uh, the God that controls the lightning is either the God who's in charge of the pantheon, or they're a warrior God, a protector God. So, God's in charge. Uh, you got your Zeus, uh, Jupiter, right? Um, they, they possess the thunderbolt. Um, lightning was so powerful and seemed to come out of nowhere. You know, even when there's a thunderstorm, you don't know where the lightning's going to strike. And it was thought that this was the gods, right? So you got Jupiter and Zeus um, 
they have the thunderbolt in other traditions uh you know with warrior guards gods you have thor uh from the old norse tradition you have indra from the uh ancient hindu tradition warrior gods that possess the thunderbolt but now of course we know that lightning is a natural phenomenon right but at the time we thought it was something divine this is as we'll see, often turns out to be the case with paranormal phenomena. We can often explain it naturally, and we just don't have the tools yet. And once we explain it, it's not really paranormal anymore. We could also extend this idea to philosophy, right? In philosophy, we have metaphysics, of course. Metaphysics is the study of reality. The Wikipedia definition of metaphysics is, uh, you know, what is what what kinds of things exist and what are they like and there are different metaphysical theories um, that don't leave room for the paranormal in philosophy so let's look at those whoops whoa where have i gone ah well we'll, we'll get to the metaphysics metaphysics in a moment um, I, I had my slides mixed up there. What's another way in which parapsychological or, or sorry, paranormal phenomena may lie outside of the realm of scientific explanation? Well, there's one idea. This is due to Dean Radden, who we will read a bit about um, in this class. He's a parapsychologist and he, um, he thinks that uh, scientists are ignoring or suppressing the study of paranormal phenomena. Here, he's talking mostly about psi phenomena. He, he, he thinks, um, and really this is, this, is, this is strange to me, but, but people like Radden claim that there is a sort of conspiracy, uh, almost like a Da Vinci Code kind of situation um, of scientists trying to suppress this knowledge. Uh, I guess because if people knew that there were psi abilities, uh, you know, it would just be too uh, bad for the people in charge, the people in power, if we all were able to unlock our psi abilities, right? Um, so this is uh, an interesting view, right? Uh, Radden, Radden does this with, with psi phenomena. And he's got this weird morphic resonance theory, which uh, maybe I'll talk about at some point in the course that uh, is really just vitalism. But also you could think here of cryptozoology where um, they study cryptids, you know, your Bigfoot, your, your, your Sasquatch, your Chupacabra, your Yeti, those guys. It's another, it's, it's also a big theme in ufology, of course. Ufology is the study of unidentified flying objects. And uh, ufologists will claim that, uh, well, of course the government is suppressing knowledge of UFOs. Of course they are. The government knows they're out there. Those aliens are out there, but they're not gonna tell us because we can't handle the truth, right? And I have to admit, I mean, there might be a tiny grain of truth to that. I mean, uh, a couple years ago, the United States Armed Forces finally admitted, yes, we have recordings of unidentified flying objects. We don't know what they are. Does that mean they're keeping the aliens in um, cryostasis in Area 51 or something? Absolutely not. It does not mean that. Uh, but this is, uh, you'll see this. There's often a grain of truth with a conspiracy built around it. In the case of aliens uh, or UFOs, uh, the government knows something. Well, yes, they had gun camera footage of things that they didn't know what they were. Uh, and, they, and they only recently uh, declassified a lot of this footage. Uh, does that mean that they're hiding the existence of intelligent alien life from us? No, it does not, right? Are there any other examples that anyone can think of, of this sort of uh, attitude, this attitude that is actually typical of conspiracy theories? Can anyone else think of an example 
of this kind of thinking and what's wrong with it. All right, I'm going to throw an example out there because everyone's being pretty quiet today. But who's heard of the birds aren't real movement? Okay, Jenna has, Dahlia has. So for those who aren't aware, <laughs> Abdullah has. Okay, good, yeah. So for those who aren't aware, it's kind of a satirical conspiracy theory where it's exactly what it sounds like birds aren't real birds are just drones the government is spying on you the birds perch on power lines that's because they're charging up on the power lines you know um the the government replaced all the birds with drones in the 70s the cia did it now this is a joke right this is this is satire it's making fun of QAnon and like moon landing 9-11 conspiracies it's making fun of all of that it's it's really good satire um but it's also a good example of the sort of problematic way of thinking this way if you think that there is a conspiracy against you then even an absence of evidence can be used as evidence for the conspiracy so if i were to say to you birds aren't real man wake up take the red pill they're they're drones man um i could say like well uh that's that's dumb have you ever like caught a bird and opened it up and seen all its mechanical parts somebody might say of course i haven't man the drones are they they never let a drone be caught man or 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 uh you know uh if i, I have a pet bird look this is a real bird they might say, well, of course they wouldn't allow uh, the drone birds into your house uh, because that would give away the plan, you know. Anything can be taken in as evidence for the thing that you're trying to establish in a conspiracy. It's, it essentially, conspiracy theories are science done backwards, right? In science, you observe, you come up with a hypothesis, you test it, and if you fail to disprove the hypothesis, then you can start building a theory about how the world works. You discover laws and build theories out of them. So, you know, science goes observation, experiment, conclusion. Conspiracy theories go conclusion and then gather evidence for that conclusion. That's a problem, and that is a problem uh, of people who think that scientists are actively suppressing the study of the paranormal. I get it. Some scientists, when you ask them, you know, you might honestly want to know, you'd ask us, Mr. Scientist, uh, what about ESP? Because maybe you believe in ESP and the scientist could go, you know, like, ah, rubbish, nonsense, bullshit. It's, there's no ESP. And you'd probably feel like, oh, uh, well, stupid scientist. The scientist is not mad at you, right? The scientist is frustrated because people believe in things that there's no evidence for. But I also understand having honest, you know, asking questions about this stuff in good faith. Um, so when you get a crusty scientist, it's not because they're suppressing the truth and part of a big conspiracy theory. It's just because they're probably a little tired of answering questions about things that they consider to be wrong. I'm, I try not to be like that. If someone has an honest to God question about some kind of paranormal phenomenon, I'll say, well, I mean, the evidence just isn't there, but who knows, you know? All right, so um, a lot of the areas that claim to be scientific, a lot of the areas ostensibly scientific areas of scholarship that study the paranormal are nowadays thought of as pseudoscience. And this includes parapsychology. So what is pseudoscience? Well, pseudoscience is a theory or uh, a body of uh, work or a discipline that looks scientific on the surface. So they use maybe some scientific sounding words or some cool devices. 
but it's actually unscientific because they don't do any of the things that scientists do. They don't collect evidence properly. They don't watch out for biases. They don't uh, test their hypotheses. Uh, they don't consider counter evidence. They certainly don't consider parsimony, the principle of parsimony, Occam's razor. Occam's razor is going to be a big theme in this class. Occam's razor says, do not multiply entities beyond necessity. Or in layman's terms, the simplest answer is the correct answer. What does that mean? If you have a system with so many postulates uh, that are already well established, and you can use that system to explain the phenomenon, awesome. But if you have to make up a whole bunch of new postulates to explain the phenomenon, when your system you've already got would work just as well, you are violating Occam's razor. So um, an encounter with a ghost, for example, perhaps someone has taken a picture and I've seen this before where somebody is using a camera and they take a picture and they see some kind of artifact in the lens and they think, oh, it's a ghost. Like we see orbs. This is a thing, you know, there's orbs, there's trails, little jellyfish looking things. So what's the simplest explanation? The simplest explanation could be that um, the lighting conditions were not great. The shutter was open on the camera for longer than would have been optimal. And you got some interesting visual artifacts just due to the way the camera was built and the way that light works. Or you saw a ghost, which would involve uh, completely reevaluating everything we know about how the world works. If you say it's a ghost, you're not applying Occam's razor. You're not applying the principle of parsimony because you've already got an explanation with way fewer unwarranted assumptions. You know how cameras work. We know how light works, right? So if we were to follow Occam's razor, we would say, oh, it's an artifact, not a picture of a ghost, right? Ah, back to metaphysics now. So uh, speaking of metaphysics, if we extend this idea that, you know, maybe there are things beyond explanation in the sense that they just haven't been explained yet, well, it would be good to talk about different metaphysical outlooks as well. One of those is metaphysical naturalism. Uh, sometimes we call this ontological naturalism, and this is a this is a metaphysical theory that makes claims about what kinds of things exist and what kinds of things do not exist. And as the name implies, um, naturalism, metaphysical naturalism, it says that only natural things exist. So matter and energy exist. The properties uh, right here, the properties associated with matter and energy. Well, I guess properly speaking. Energy is a property, isn't it? If we're getting, if we're going to be technical, energy is a property. These are real, but there is nothing supernatural or, or paranormal um, on metaphysical naturalism. There's no gods, there's no souls, nothing like that. So that's one metaphysical framework that a lot of scientists would probably describe themselves as. I certainly am well within this camp myself. I'm a thoroughgoing metaphysical naturalist. But if you don't want to go that far, that's fine. There's also methodological naturalism. This is treated as a sub-branch sometimes of metaphysical naturalism, but it need not be uh, because it only makes claims about what we can study and understand, not about what exists. So uh, methodological naturalism would say that we can study the natural universe. We could study um, physics, chemistry, and biology. Scientists are studying these things now. Philosophers studied them back in the day, you know, way back when science just used to be called natural philosophy. So uh, science works for studying what is natural. Maybe there are some supernatural or paranormal phenomena, but science doesn't, that's not what science is for. Uh, so when I talk about naturalism, I'm kind of talking interchangeably about these two things, me metaphysical naturalism and methodological naturalism. It's up to you. You'll probably try to decide for yourself as the course um, proceeds uh, whether you fall into one of these camps. 
right? Um, a lot of scientists are certainly um, uh, metaphysical naturalists like me, uh, but there are also methodological naturalists. These would be scientists who, for example, um, study the natural sciences and do a very good job at it, uh, but maybe they're also religious. For example, um, there's a scientist who uh, does very great work in the lab. Maybe they study the theory of evolution. I don't know, you know, that maybe a biologist. But then on Sunday, they go to church with their family. Uh, and, and there are lots of scientists like that. And they would be methodological naturalists. Uh, science is good for studying the natural world, but um, there are other, uh, other areas of life. There's religion, uh, for example, uh, and science and religion might be non-overlapping magisteria, as Stephen Jay Gould once said. Um, speaking of religion, this uh, brings me to the supernatural. Sometimes there's a bit of overlap between the supernatural and the paranormal when we discuss these things. You should be aware that uh, these terms don't always refer to the same kinds of things. The supernatural specifically refers to things that are beyond the presently understood laws of nature or just beyond. So what would be an example of something supernatural? supernatural phenomena or supernatural being. I got one. It starts with the letter G. Go ahead, Daniel. Oh, I was just going to suggest just going off the definition here. Maybe you could say something like, um, like whatever it is that we're accounting for with the term dark matter. Oh, <laughs> interesting. That's really interesting because, um, because when it comes to dark matter, um, it's one of those things where we don't know what it is, but we know it's there. We know it's there because of its effect on other, uh, you know, like regular matter, right? I wouldn't say it's supernatural. Uh, weirdly enough, it could be considered paranormal in a certain sense that I will get to in a moment. Um, but that is an interesting example. Uh, Alexis, you've got your hand up as well. Yeah, um, as long as we're talking about, you know, religion, possibly things like angels, demons, that kind of realm of being supernatural. Absolutely. Um, and a number of people in the chat uh, got it. That's the one I was going for was God, right? God is the ultimate supernatural being, you know, and I realize, uh, you know, not everyone's gonna, not everyone in this class believes in God. I myself am an atheist. But uh, if you were to like, pick a supernatural being that's well obviously that would be like the number one supernatural being um <clears throat> certainly i think a lot of um theologians and religious scholars would agree that god is beyond the laws of nature if god exists god is above and beyond those laws so god would be supernatural ghosts might be um Definitely, as Alexa said, uh, angels, demons, these would be supernatural. Um, the jinn get talked about a lot in this class, which is cool. The jinn are uh, um, spirits of smokeless fire uh, from pre-Islamic and then later on Islamic folklore. And they're really fun to talk about. And they are also an example of uh, a religious or, or folkloristic belief that's kind of gotten appropriated, right? Because you have the jinn, which are beings of smokeless fire, and some are good, some are evil, and they, they just kind of live in their unseen dimension, um, doing their jinn stuff. But, uh, you know, then you have, um, like, Aladdin, and you have the genie of, of the lamp, which comes from uh, the Thousand and One Nights, um, which was also, I'm pretty sure, written by a European guy. So, um, you know, if nothing else, uh, talking about these kinds of supernatural beings is an opportunity to learn about, like, what 
what people actually believe about them and not the the disneyfied version so yeah those angels demons jinn god gods all supernatural and some things that are paranormal are also supernatural so i think ghosts uh if there were ghosts um if there were if, if there were souls that survived the death of the body that would be supernatural i don't see how we could explain that naturalistically sometimes they do this in star trek uh star trek's supposed to be science fiction um but then they'll have uh oh no something happened where uh captain kirk's mental energy is transferred to spock so now spock is kirk and kirk is spock and they've switched bodies his soul is in the other thing i'm like but but how though like men mental what's mental energy his soul like so you know same with if you survived the death or if you had an out-of-body experience right that would that would seem to me to be super yeah free a freaky friday situation i think i think this just happened on an episode of that new star trek show where spock and his fiance switch bodies and it's kind of funny like it's a funny gender bender comedy kind of thing you know um but 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 i have to suspend my disbelief <laughs> so so ghosts might be uh paranormal and supernatural uh aliens if there were aliens would probably just be paranormal until we understood more about them and then they would just be normal something like miracles if miracles were real those would be supernatural but not not paranormal to my mind they're not weird enough they're not spooky enough you know they're not frightening or they might be frightening but not in the um in the in the in the in in the in the, in the creepy dark mysterious enigmatic sense um that a lot of supernatural or, or a lot of paranormal phenomena are. So uh, a metaphysical naturalist would just deny that the supernatural exists. They would say that, okay, there's no gods, there's no angels, demons, jinn, no ghosts. Maybe there's aliens, but we got to wait and see. Um, a methodological naturalist would just say, well, they could they could deny the, the supernatural or they might say, sure, uh, they might believe in God. Right. There's a lot of scientists who are religious. They believe in God, uh, but they just say, well, that's not what science is for. Science um, science tells us how the heavens go. The Bible tells you how to go to heaven, to paraphrase Galileo. Right. But maybe and and i wonder about this some supernatural or paranormal phenomena maybe they could in principle be explained by science and they just haven't been explained yet um again i i apologize for all the silly examples i'm using but you might want to think here of the force from star wars right um everyone you know han solo's like ah it's a bunch of nonsense these old wizards it's a bunch of baloney these jedi right uh but it's the force it's just an energy field and you've got your midichlorians or whatever and there's an in-universe naturalistic explanation for people using the force right it could all, of course turn out that um maybe some supernatural or, or paranormal phenomena are like that um but it's important to be very skeptical um important to be skeptical uh, for reasons that we'll get to shortly. Now, when did the word paranormal enter the English? <laughs> well, I would say the other way around, right? Um, but I don't know, because Star Trek is tries to be supernaturalistic. But I, I was I was talking with another instructor, uh, Phil Hoyek, um, who teaches uh philosophy and sci-fi and we were we were nerding out about star trek and and he said to me like star trek is the only franchise that has dualism and functionalism and i was like yeah i know it's awfully strange isn't it um so you know yeah but half the time it's it's like they're doing magic they just have to push buttons to do to do the magic like 
you know. What did Arthur C. Clarke say? Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I mean, Star Trek is a great example of that. Um, and Star Wars too, really. Um, but so where did the word paranormal come from? Um, people have uh, sort of understood the word differently over the years. Um, Penman's little uh, article in Notes and Queries is really cool because it's he sort of answers this question. He noticed that, um, I'll just get myself out of the way of my words here. Um, he shows that uh, paranormal entered the English language in the early 20th century. Uh, but he noticed something funny. Um, the first uh, uh, entry of the word paranormal in the Oxford English Dictionary, which is like the dictionary of the English language. Um, it lists the first occurrence of the word in 1920 revision of another dictionary. And this is weird because dictionaries are not uh, where we put new words that like, oh, I'm going to define this word by uh, just throwing it in a dictionary. No, dictionaries record words that are already in use. So it's very weird that the OED was like, oh, the first occurrence of this word was in another dictionary. Well, no, that it would not have been the first occurrence of the, of the word in another dictionary. It must have come from somewhere else, but where? Well, uh, that's what Penman talks about. Now, it, here in this 1920 OED entry, it defined paranormal as phenomena analogous to physical phenomena, but with no known physical cause, such as mediumistic raps, telekinesis, and so on. But, but what, what gives? This, this uh, word um, would have been in use in English prior to 1920, if, if, if it was in the dictionary in 1920. So... Um, what does Penman say here? He writes that post X-Files, the term paranormal is ubiquitous. In popular culture and in some reference works it is often used to designate all manner of supernatural phenomena from psychic activity to spirit contact, sometimes branching out to incorporate subjects as diverse as extraterrestrial life, ghosts, cryptozoology, and the Bermuda Triangle. This was, however, not always the case. And indeed, uh, I think that television show, The X-Files, uh, which was on in the 90s, uh, did a lot to popularize the paranormal um, and to make it sort of like uh, encompass more than the word initially referred to. Uh, you know, prior to 1920, the word paranormal referred to the kinds of things that psychical researchers and parapsychologists would study psi phenomena. So telepathy, clairvoyance, telekinesis, and these kinds of things. This goes back to the earlier spiritualist movement. Uh, we would we called these psychic or psychical phenomena, which did not necessarily imply something paranormal or supernatural at the time. At the time in the 19th century, psychical was the word for mental. That's it, right? It didn't mean, um, oh, the, the, these psychical powers, it didn't mean that they were supernatural necessarily. It just meant that they had some mental power or believed they had a mental power to uh, read minds or predict what card is next in the deck or something like that, right? So that's all that means. And um, initially, paranormal seemed to refer only to these sorts of phenomena, psychical or psi phenomena. It was thanks to X-Files and, and also books, a lot of books, a lot of TV shows like Unexplained Mysteries, you know, th those kinds of shows. Or um, what was the one in the 90s with Jonathan Frakes, like Beyond Belief? And um, he'd tell you a story and you had to guess whether it was made up or whether it was based on you know, some tale like of, of a ghost story or something, right? Um, pretty cheesy, pretty funny, but uh, yeah, good, good, uh, good, good bit of nostalgia there. Um, now, in the late 19th century, in 1882, uh, the SPR, or Society for Psychical Research, was first established, where there was a moral philosopher, Henry Sidgwick, a classicist, 
Oh, excuse me. Named Frederick William Henry Myers and a psychologist named Edmund Gurney. They founded this in England, uh, but it boasted an international um, uh, membership devoted to understanding, quote, mesmeric, psychical, and spiritualistic. So, um, you know, paranormal stuff, really. This is in the late 19th century. It was uh, a few decades before this that the Fox sisters first uh, became famous in the United States. And if you recall, they were the two that sort of kicked off the spiritualist movement. So this is after spiritualism has been around for a few decades. And there are some scientists and philosophers who are saying, let's get together and try and study uh, this. What did they call it, though? Well, they didn't call it the paranormal. They called it the supernormal. This term was introduced by Myers. Uh, I'll read you the full quote. He wrote, I have ventured to coin the word supernormal to be applied to phenomena which are beyond what usually happens, beyond that is, in the sense of suggesting unknown psychical laws. It is thus formed on the analogy of abnormal. When we speak of, a, of an abnormal phenomenon, we do not mean one which contravenes natural laws, but one which exhibits them in unusual uh, or an inexplicable form. Similarly, by a supernatural phenomenon, I mean not one which overrides natural laws, for I believe no such phenomenon to exist, but one which exhibits the action of laws higher in a physical aspect than are discerned in action in everyday life. By higher, either in a psychical or physiological sense, I mean apparently belonging to a more advanced stage of evolution. Whoops. So supernormal is an attempt to uh, sort of develop a nomenclature or a vocabulary for the study of these phenomena that are uh, not claimed uh, to violate the laws of nature, uh, but rather may represent undiscovered laws of nature. Um, and just to draw your attention here, um, by higher, I mean apparently belonging to a more advanced stage of evolution. So the initial thing that the uh, psychical research people um, we're interested in looking at reminds me very much of the X-Men. So you're all familiar with Marvel's X-Men comics, uh, or if not the comics, the characters, right? Professor Charles Xavier doesn't have a paranormal or supernatural ability. He's just a mutant. And uh, it's like humans are evolving, and that's what the mutants are, right? They're just evolving. Um, what Meyer says here just reminds me so much of the X-Men. Um, this is the kind of thing they had in mind. Like, oh, maybe there are some people with special abilities and it's not magic. It just might represent how humans are developing. Maybe we're evolving. You see this in science fiction too. You know, future societies where humans are all telepathic or something, right? You know, science. The word supernormal uh, was used until about 1905, and that's when paranormal entered the English language. It entered via French. Here are some French words, paranormal, 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 uh, that, are, that were borrowed um, and anglicized as paranormal. Um, and paranormal was popularized by Joseph Maxwell's book, Metaphysical Phenomena. I think this definition of meso, meta, uh, this uh, title, metaphysical phenomena, may be one of the reasons why um, you know you have your metaphysics and philosophy. What exists? What is it like? Right? When we do metaphysics and philosophy, what are we doing? We're asking like, you know, does God exist? Does uh, the soul exist? Is there free will? Uh, what are minds? Right? Um, that's metaphysics in philosophy. But there's also metaphysics in the new age section of the bookstore sense where, you know, it's, it's, uh, I mean, I, I saw, I saw, I saw this in Toronto. I was in Toronto, um, the weekend before last and I passed by this Reiki studio, you know, Reiki is a Japanese healing art supposed to involve manipulating energy, right? 
and and they they also sold all the metaphysical supplies that you need set on the set on the side metaphysical supplies what were they talking about well you know um crystals uh singing bowls incense books you know so there's metaphysics in philosophy and then there's like metaphysics in spiritualist stuff and i think this might be where that came from this might be where that split happened was maxwell's book which was entitled metaphysical phenomena and he didn't mean you know free will souls and you know stuff like that he meant paranormal phenomena uh so he defines paranormal in a way that aligns with um uh myers's uses of supernormal and the understanding uh, that would later uh, emerge within parapsychology, that is understanding psychic or psychical phenomena as things that did not violate the laws of nature, but which simply were yet to be explained. So Maxwell wrote, uh, Maxwell writes, properly speaking, there is no veritable automat automatism in phenomena of sensitivity, but we can nevertheless distinguish therein first normal sensitive phenomena, that is to say, Phenomena produced under physiological conditions more or less well known, but frequent, uh, such as hallucinations, hypermnesia, and second, paranormal phenomena, that is to say, phenomena which imply the existence of modes of perception to which the normal person is foreign, clairvoyance, clairaudience, telesthesia, telepathy, and exteriorization of motor power. So all psi phenomena, as we would call them today. Um, J. Lewis McIntyre, in a review of Maxwell's work, would later add that, quote, the sensitives, so Maxwell's term for those possessing psychical abilities, are persons who are indeed paranormal, but who are not therefore to be described as degenerates, neurotics, or hysterics. Rather, they have powers which at present transcend those of other men, but which may at some future phase of evolution become themselves the rule rather than the exception. Again, uh, very, uh, very X-Men, very, um, very uh, not really, it's it, it, at this point, if you, 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 if you were to read this, uh, I, I would say that uh, if you were to say that, no, what they are doing is natural science, I wouldn't tell you you're wrong. I think at this point, yes, they were doing things the right way. They were saying, hey, some interesting claims are being made here. Let's look into it. Uh, what could it be? Well, if the claims are true and people really have these abilities, well, it's not magic. There's got to be an explanation. So really, I mean, that's not a bad start. I think they could have used a little more skepticism, but it's not a bad start. So um, Penman notes in his little paper how uh, these definitions incorporate, you know, the Maxwell's definition of supernormal or supernatural or, uh, sorry, paranormal incorporates elements of Myers's supernormal. In each case, we're talking about people uh, who possess these paranormal abilities as representing a possible future direction for our evolution. And both words, supernormal and paranormal, are aimed at capturing the sense in which the phenomena they refer to are beyond normal experience or normal scientific explanation. So, uh, in fact, um, uh, supernormal and paranormal were used uh, quite interchangeably. Um, there's a lot of published research from this area on psychic phenomena from, from, from this era, the 1920s and 30s where we see this we see that um paranormal and supernormal are used pretty much the same way uh sometimes paranormal would even uh, be used in scientific literature to describe something unusual not necessarily something frightening or spooky or supernatural uh in penman's uh paper there's a quote from some veterinarian who described uh some cells he's like these, these weird cells uh, there's some these are normal cells but these are cells over here are a bit weird they're paranormal cells but he didn't mean that they were like you know cells with powers they were cells that were just a bit weird so this would be like dark matter like daniel mentioned earlier you know back in the day if you told uh if i said to some of these guys 
well, what about this? I've got this hypothesis about dark matter. It's quite paranormal. They might understand that in the sense of just like, okay, it's just, it's out of the realm of scientific explanation currently. But now the paranormal has taken on this association with specifically psychical phenomena, as well as other weird unexplained phenomena. And that is due to Joseph Banks Brian and his wife, Louisa. In the 1930s, they published uh, a lot of material on extrasensory perception, and they used the term paranormal. And this, of course, ultimately gave the term its popular boost that it needed to refer to uh, not just psi phenomena, but other weird unexplained phenomena. So parapsychology still remained concerned with psychical or psi phenomena, but now the word paranormal um, thanks to the influence of the Rhines, refers to lots of different phenomena. So we're talking UFOs, alien abductions, cryptids, ghosts, uh, anything like that. So we're gonna. That's why we're gonna take a similarly broad approach in this class. We're not just gonna look at psychical phenomena. We are, as we saw earlier, going to look at some of those um, other unexplained phenomena, but we're going to make sure we understand what exactly parapsychology is. And, um, you know, the, the, the common theme that's going to tie everything together is probably going to be psi phenomena and parapsychology. So let's talk a little bit about parapsychology before we finish up. So um, where, where what I was uh, reading before was drawn primarily from Penman's short paper. This is drawn from Hyman's paper. Hyman's an interesting guy because he's a psychologist who has critically evaluated uh, some of this parapsychological research, uh, as we'll talk about in a moment. The CIA, back in the day during the Cold War, um, investigated the possible use of clairvoyance uh, for espionage. If you want to remember this, you can just ESP espionage kind of fun little wordplay there um uh the cia invent uh, uh investigated this and and hyman was one of the people that evaluated the data that were collected in that project he and and a statistician a statistician named jessica utz utz believes in the paranormal uh hyman does not and that's probably because before hyman became a psychologist he was a magician and as we will see, magicians know the tricks of the trade. Um, they really do. Um, a, a magician can, you know, perform feats of mentalism and uh, give you this, give you the impression that they can read your mind or divine details from you the same way a psychic or a medium would. The only difference is the magician will tell you that they are lying to you. Um, and I've been to live magic shows where this is done, and it's actually really cool, even if you know it's not real. It's like, but how, uh, you know? So um, yeah, uh, magicians, um, they know. So the Journal of Parapsychology, according to Hyman defines a parapsychology as the branch of science that deals with psi communication. That is behavioral or personal exchanges with the environment, which are extrasensory motor, not dependent on the senses and muscles. So psi is defined as a general term to identify a person's extrasensory motor communication with the environment. And psi includes ESP, which is extrasensory perception. Uh, so that's experience of or contact to a target object, state, event, or influence without sensory contact. So here we're talking uh, telepathy, which would be like sending or receiving thoughts mentally. Clairvoyance, which would be uh, knowledge of the environment or precognition, like knowledge of the future. E, uh, psi also includes PK, uh, psychokinesis. This is the extramotor aspect of psi, a direct, that is mental but non-muscular influence exerted by the subject on an external physical process condition or object. So we're talking, whoops, we're talking moving things with your mind, basically. Uh, there are a lot of videos uh, on the internet that purport to show people doing this. Um, 
uh, one thing you can look up is called a psi wheel. A psi wheel is a little paper wheel that you make and you sit it on a thing and uh, people will claim to move the psi wheel with their mind. How the psi wheel actually works, I suspect, has more to do with airflow, temperature changes, and, and, and simple physics. Nonetheless, um, you know, uh, they, are, they are all over the place. There's also bending spoons, bending keys. Again, this is, this is magic tricks. Uh, um, you know, not to rain on anyone's parade, but but a lot of claims of telekinesis are really revolve. They really revolve around spoon bending, and the main spoon bender was a, uh, or I believe he's still alive. He's a man named Yuri Geller uh, from Israel, a claimed uh, claimed to be a psychic uh, who would bend spoons. Of course, the way he bends spoons is the exact same way magicians bend spoons, or it seems to be. So as James Randi, uh, a very, very famous uh, magician and skeptic um, said years ago, if Yuri Geller is using psychic powers, he's doing it the hard way. Um, so uh, yeah, you know, not to be a downer, but a lot of it is magic tricks. And, a, and some of these I will show you as, as, the, class, as the class goes. I'll throw in a magic trick now and then just, just for funsies. Okay, so, right. Ryan adapted the term parapsychology from parapsychology, the German form of parapsychology. He replaced, uh, or rather, thanks to the Rhines, it replaced terms like supernormal and psychical research. And one thing that Ryan did uh, that was a lot different from the psychical researchers is that Ryan emphasized controlled experiments using ordinary people. Psychical researchers would, would you know, find somebody like, and, and we'll talk about this in, in our lecture on ESP and PK. Um, you know, they would find somebody who claimed to be a clairvoyant or a medium who claimed to have special powers and then they'd evaluate them. Ryan didn't do that. Ryan just looked at normal people, just, just random experimental participants. Come on in and do some experiments and we're going to see if we can find some psychic powers, right? He also avoided a lot of paranormal phenomena. Uh, he, did, he didn't want to have anything to do with stuff like haunted houses, ghosts, or life after death. This was another way he departed from the spiritualists and the psychical researchers. The psychical researchers, thanks to the spiritualist movement, were very interested in the possibility of life after death. And so they would have spirit mediums hold seances to try and make contact with these spirits. Ryan said, no, that's, this is silly. We need to look and see uh, what regular people are doing because there's such a worry of fraud. And there, there were and are frauds out there uh, doing the spirit medium stuff. So um, in the late 1920s, uh, Joseph and Louisa Ryan began working at Duke University, um, where they started the parapsychology lab, and they tried to make it into an experimental science, a proper experimental science. And usually they would use Zenner cards. These are Zenner cards. They're named after Dr. Zenner, who invented them. And basically, you have a deck of Zenner cards and you use them for guessing. You'll have five different symbols. You have the square, the circle, the cross, the star, and the wavy lines. Often, they're also different colors. This is just a crappy stock photo, as you can see. So they're not colored. Uh, but we have a deck of Zenner cards. The deck contains 25 cards. And we have five symbols, so we have uh, five occurrences of each symbol in a given deck. And uh, we can use these in experiments on telepathy, clairvoyance, and precognition. For telepathy, uh, for example, what the Rhines would do is um, have a sender draw the card. Maybe it has the square on it, and now I have to look at the card and concentrate on the square, and I have to send that to you. And then you have to guess which is the receiver has to guess which card I sent. Um, and because there's 25 cards, five symbols repeat five times, you have a one in five chance of getting that card, getting guessing the right symbol. If you're doing clairvoyance, uh, maybe what they'll do is uh, uh, shuffle the deck 
and then you have to use your powers to tell where in the deck the target card is like oh there's a target cir the circle is three cards from the top you know something like that precognition similarly you might be having the cards dealt and you've got to predict which will be dealt next right or something like that so we can use these and because we know the the chance hit rate one in five we can very easily see if there's a hit rate greater than five and in extrasensory perception the rhines collected data on over ninety thousand guesses the average number of hits per run of 25 cards was 7.1 and the chance remember is five now with a data set this size that actually is significant that is greater than that is that is bigger than what you'd expect than if people were just getting the correct guesses you know due to chance so the scientific community began to take an interest in esp now this is another thing about science it uses math when we do experiments in psychology and well heck even parapsychology here um we're often trying to test hypotheses that's not what was happening here rather we were measuring hit rates but in either case if you can show that the result you got was statistically significant, uh, that basically means it's not due to chance. So you, it means that you got the result you did as a result of your experimental manipulation, you know, your different conditions or whatever, uh, rather than just it just happened to go that way. Same here. Um, uh, a, a hit rate of 7.1, given that there were that many guesses, is 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 pretty significant that's that's big so the scientific community got interested but here's the problem those that hit rate could still have been due to chance how do we know well other researchers failed to replicate this they collected a lot of guesses and they just didn't get the hit rate that the rhines got the rhines uh, seem to be pretty good researchers um, there was never any whiff of fraud, uh, at least not on their part, um, in, in the course of their, uh, of their research. So it could just be that they got the 7.1 hit rate due to chance. Uh, and if, if it's really not due to chance, then if someone else does a, collects a similar number of guesses, they should get a similar hit rate or even a greater hit rate, but that didn't happen. So that suggests that in this series of guesses it just happened that that's the way the numbers went there were also criticisms of his research methodologies offered um the methodological criticisms were were the most problematic so we're talking about things like sensory leakage and you know uh, designing the experiments in a way that people can kind of see through what's going on or maybe like hack the experiment or cheat uh, so one example would be like if we were doing Zener cards and I hold the card here, I'm like, okay, what card am I thinking of? And you go, it's a square, but it's not because you have magic powers. It's because you see the reflection in my glasses, right? So stuff like this is stuff that they didn't watch out for um, that proved problematic for Joseph Banks and Louisa Ryan. Um, but nonetheless, they established the basic procedures that parapsychologists would use um, from that time through the 1970s. They would use the ESP cards. Um, that's how they would uh, investigate telepathy, clairvoyance, and precognition. And Rhine, or, or the Rhines, I should say, uh, were also the first to study psychokinesis. Uh, what they did for this was have the participants try and influence the outcomes of dice throws. So the idea is you throw the die, uh, and I guess I'm trying to make the die land on a specific number using my mind, right? So they tried to do that as well. Now, you can still check out some of this research um, uh, after class, and I'll, I'll probably share this on the Discord server. After class, uh, click this link here, and you can go see some parapsychologists at the Rhine Research Center. This is the successor to their lab at Duke University, but it's no longer affiliated with Duke University. And they use the Zener cards to test telepathy. Uh, I ask here, are you surprised by the results? Why or why not? Well, think about it. Once you see it, I mean, it's really, I don't wanna give the whole video away, 
but it's really not. It's really exactly what you'd expect if you were a skeptic. Try a couple car guesses. None of them are correct. Um, and, and they just continue being parapsychologists. So, you know, uh, you tell me what you think on the Discord server after you go and watch that video. Now, towards the 1970s, it started to become clear uh, that the Rhine's early successes were difficult to replicate. Right. Some cases of outright fraud even occurred, as in the work of Sol. Sol was a chemist, I believe, who took an interest in trying to replicate some of these studies. Uh, and, and he's really sneaky the way he went about this. Um, uh, this is talked about in Hyman's paper. Uh, he found non significant results for, you know, however tens of thousands of guesses he collected, except for two people. Everybody was not psychic, except for two people who had hit rates that were way above chance. Um, and there was another thinker who, who had set out to try and vindicate Soul's work. I can't remember her name. It always escapes me, but it is in Hyman's paper, who set out to go, no, Soul didn't mess anything up with these two people. And she found that she, he had actually been leaving blank spaces where he could go back and insert hits where there weren't any. So it turned out that Sol was um, uh, sharing fraudulent data when it came to his two, um, his two purported psychics. Some thought that we could address these problems by improving the research tools though. So we can't do much about fraud, but we can, uh, we can address some of the method methodological concerns. We could use less abstract and more emotionally charged symbols on Zener cards, right? Not crosses and circles and wavy lines, but food or a member of the opposite sex or um, money, you know, something that means something, something that's emotionally charged rather than something that's kind of arbitrary and meaningless. Uh, computers with random number generators instead of dice began to be used to study PK. And recently we've got the Gansfeld experiments. Gansfeld comes from the German for whole field or entire field. The Gansfeld refers to this field that's created by placing ping pong balls over the eyes. So we cut a ping pong ball in half and put it over. We play some white noise in the headphones and we put a red light on. And the result is, is you're in this weird pink white noise field with your eyes closed. And this is used to study telepathy. Uh, a lot like with Zener cards, a sender might try to um, send a thought or communicate a thought to a receiver. Um, the receiver, this is the receiver, by the way, this is always the receiver. I would be unblindfolded and I'd just be concentrating on sending a word. Um, while the receiver is in the Gansfeld, she talks out loud, she describes what she sees. And when she's removed from the Gansfeld, she's asked to choose the object that was communicated from a set of objects, you know? So uh, I don't have very many objects. It's um, a good object. Maybe I have a piggy bank, um, you know, piggy bank, tiny piano, sparkling water. So there's a predetermined set and uh, you know, I don't know what they are uh, as the receiver. I don't know what they are, but the sender knows all three, but the sender says, oh, I'm only going to send tiny piano. And, um, and then the receiver sees the three objects and has to pick. Um, now the results uh, will depend on whether the hit rate is significantly greater than chance, right? Um, and sometimes we even incorporate computers uh, so rather than having physical objects present, uh, maybe, maybe a computer will have a list of objects and it will choose what the sender has to try and communicate, uh, for example. That's called an Otto Gansfeld experiment. And again, these are all aimed at improving methodology. Now, parapsychologists will say that the hit rates are often above chance. Uh, in experiments like this in Otto Gansfeld or using the Zener cards, um, and that this serves as evidence for psi phenomena. But skeptics are, of course, skeptical. Skeptics doubt this. 
Skeptics argue that meta-analyses reveal that hit rates are in fact not as high, uh, or at least not significantly above chance, as many parapsychologists claim. A meta-analysis, by the way, is a way of retrospectively looking at the results of many, many different studies altogether. You try to um, get rid of all the little differences between the studies and try to see what all of their results together mean. And when we do these meta-analyses, meta often we find that the hit rates are not significantly above chance. Um, and we also find very small or non-existent effect sizes. So that should cause us to ask, you know, is there even effect at all? It could just be an artifact in, in the data, right? And, and, and most importantly, um, even some of the initially impressive results, like those of the rhymes, we can't, we just can't replicate them. And that's important, right? Even if um, you go like, oh, I got, Maybe you got like a, 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 a hit rate of 10. Like that would be insane. I got a hit rate of 10 in my 100,000 guesses. Um, you know, a scientist would be like, wow, that's crazy. I got to try and replicate that. Uh, but if they failed to replicate it, well, that would be a pretty good reason to think that, well, I just got that hit rate due to chance. I know that your chances of that are rare, but it was still due to chance, right? Um, and that's why replicability is so important. Now, yes, I know, maybe there are some psychology people in the class who are like, hang on, Josh, isn't there a replication crisis in psychology right now? Yeah, but that's mostly to do with psychology journals, right? Psychology journals want to publish new stuff, right? So a lot of times, you know, if you do a replication of a famous study, you, you might do it as a class project or as an undergrad thesis. You don't do it as an actual paper because it doesn't get published. Because number one, if you replicate it, a lot of these journals have this like, oh, big deal. We knew that was true anyway. Uh, or you fail to replicate it. Oh, well, you got a null result. We can't publish that. So it's like, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. Now there, it's getting a little bit better. There are journals specifically for replicating studies. And we are finding that some really important uh, findings in psychology are going unreplicated, which is good. That's good. That's how science works. Uh, but same thing here. If there is a real effect, we should be able to replicate it. And replication in parapsychology seems to be quite elusive. And that is one reason why I am skeptical of the claims of parapsychology. So there are even psychologists. I, I, I was going to put her picture here, but I'll have to put it later. But there are psychologists who, in the face of a lack of evidence, even abandon parapsychology. And some of the chapters that we'll be reading in this class are from such a parapsychologist. She's uh, Susan Blackmore. She's a well-known skeptic. But she began her career as a parapsychologist researching uh, whether people could influence, you know, random number generators and, and this kind of thing in a parapsychology lab. When she failed to find anything and failed to replicate and, you know, when it just didn't work, um, she abandoned parapsychology and now uh, is a science communicator, uh, a visiting lecturer. She talks a lot about psychology, consciousness. Um, drugs and altered states. Uh, she's a very unique, uh, a very unique personality. So some of the chapters uh, that we'll be reading in this class are actually selections from her book on consciousness. So when we talk about uh, ESP and PK, um, and also when we talk about communication with the dead, we'll be reading some chapters from Susan Blackmore's book. Uh, if you want to read her story, uh, I've linked it here. Uh, the Elusive Open Mind, 10 Years of Negative Research in Parapsychology, where she discusses how, well, she just, after 10 years of negative results, she had to give up, you know? Others, uh, other parapsychologists or, or psychologists who have contact with parapsychologists know the tricks of the trade. So where 
where um you know susan blackmore was somebody i think who who, who began this research in good faith and 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 realize, you know, as a good scientist would, that when the evidence wasn't there for the phenomenon she was trying to study, she she said, "Well, I guess these phenomena are not real." Um, Ray Hyman, who I mentioned before, is a magician. Uh, he was a magician and mentalist before he became a psychologist. And like many others, including Harry Houdini, uh, James Randi, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, Chris Angel, Penn and Teller, Darren Brown, they all perform acts of mentalism, which in magic means uh, apparent psychic or telekinetic phenomena, but they're accomplished using an apparatus that the audience doesn't understand, uh, but which isn't supernatural. Um, often uh, in, in, in magicians terminology, I believe this is called a gaff. Um, and there are lots of different gaffs. It depends on what you do, right? But um, uh, in levitation tricks, you're often talking about just things which the audience can't see, wires, boards, stuff the audience can't see. Um, you're probably talking about, um, well, I'll get to this in a moment, but there's a lot of cool magic stuff that psychics are doing without realizing they're doing it. And all of these names, I, I, I mention them because they are, are all out, all are or were outspoken against um, who they perceive to be fraudsters. Um, Harry Houdini um, was a vocal critic of spirit mediums back in the day. James Randi uh, is very well known uh, for his feud with Yuri Geller and, uh, and his million dollar challenge, which his educational foundation offered to anyone who could prove in a scientific setting that they had paranormal or supernatural powers. And they had all kinds of interesting people try to claim prize money. Uh, there was one guy who said he glows in the dark. Um, psychics, obviously, magnetic people, you know, they claim to be magnet, like the people who claimed the vaccine would make them magnetic and they were sticking things to themselves. So before the COVID vaccine magnetic thing, there was just this idea that some people were magnetic and I guess some people thought they were magnetic and had you know, magnetic powers. I don't know. Uh, Chris Angel, uh, he's kind of a, I don't know, he's kind of like, you know, uh, he's kind of a kind of a douche. But, but uh, he is also a skeptic. I don't know. I, why do I say that? He's too... So on his old show, Mind Freak, and this is completely personal tangent, uh, he would do... Um, he would do stage magic and pass it off as close-up magic. Like, like David Blaine, when he did his street magic special back in the early 2000s, he was actually doing really good card manipulation, really good mechanics, you know? That takes skill. Uh, and, and there's no big crazy apparatus. Chris Angel is doing what he does on the Las Vegas stage, but making it, but filming it outside and making it seem like he's out in the wild. And I, I, I just, it breaks the immersion for me, you know? Anyway, Penn and Teller, awesome. They're great because they do acts of mentalism and, and magic. And then they tell you how they do their tricks. So that's fun. And Darren Brown from the UK, a uh, very famous mentalist who uh, has, has spent a lot of time critically examining the claims of mediums and psychics and so forth, and kind of showing how the tricks are done, right? So very good. Uh, these magicians have been the, the most uh, ardent critics of paranormal research. So if you want later, you can check out James Randi here on a quick video bending a spoon uh, without using um, any kind of paranormal ability. He basically uses a technique called ratcheting. And uh, this just involves um, bending the spoon or the key covertly. Uh, you also just use good old fashioned visual illusions, right? Like, you know, the illusion where if you wobble a pencil in front, it looks, it looks like it's wiggly and bendy. 
it's it's just visual illusions combined with a bit of ratcheting. Um, but there are also many different techniques that magicians use um, that psychics, whether they are uh, aware or not, also use, uh, like cold reading. Cold reading is when um, during a reading, the reader, whether they're a mentalist or a psychic, will sort of go fishing for information uh, in such a way that it makes it seem like they knew the information psychically, when really the person who's being read offered that information to them, right? There's also hot reading, which is like if I were to, uh, uh, there's, a, there's an example we'll look at later in the course, uh, Peter Popoff, who was a faith healer. Now, Peter Popoff would uh, pick people out of the audience and he would say, you know, oh, it's your arthritis, for example. And the person really would have arthritis and he would do his laying on of hands uh, and the whole faith healing thing. But it was weird uh, how he seemed to pick out, oh, your name is Anna and you have arthritis. And the person in the audience is like, oh, yeah, that's, yeah. How'd you know? You know, they think it's the Holy Spirit, right? Before these shows, the guests fill out prayer cards. You know, why are you here? What are you praying for? What do you want to be healed? Right? These are handed in. James Randi, the magician before, what does he do? He brings uh, a radio receiver to one of Popoff's um, programs. And uh, it was determined that Popoff's wife was directing him to specific audi audience members through his earpiece using the radio. So they'd say, oh, you need to find this woman. Her name is this, and she has this. And it would appear that, you know, he was getting divine revelation. But really, it was just from his wife reading these prayer cards. That's hot reading. So hot reading is when you're, like, actively going in and grabbing the information. Cold reading is when I get you to offer it up without realizing. Misdirection is, is also um, a big one, more for magicians and mentalists. But misdirection relies on basic facts about human perception like change blindness and inattentional blindness and oftentimes um you know magicians and psychics are accomplishing their effects right under your nose they are just skillfully getting you to look elsewhere when when the magic happens as it were and forced choices there are forced choices that uh mentalists and magicians can use to make it look uh as though they are using some kind of magic powers, right? So uh, those are some of the tricks of the trade. Um, so here we are. Uh, let's see, how are we doing for time? Oh, wow. It's been a while. Jeez, I can really get, get talking when I want to. So yes, yeah, so this is a summary for today of what we've discussed. Uh, so you should have a basic understanding of the kinds of things that would count as paranormal if they were real. Uh, and if you prefer to remain agnostic about whether some of these things are real or not, fine, right? Like, uh, I, am, I am trying to teach you to be critical and skeptical in this class. I'm not going to just tell you, don't believe in anything. Believe what you want. But you should have good reasons for believing what you believe. And part of the way that you can find those good reasons for your beliefs, to underwrite your beliefs, is by asking questions and applying doubt. So that's why I encourage that approach. But these things, if they were shown to exist, would certainly count as paranormal, uh, psychic phenomena, right? That's initially what the paranormal referred to. But after, um, whoops, after the work of the Rhines um, and a lot of popular literature, uh, it, it expanded to include ghosts, hauntings, aliens and UFOs, um, cryptids like Bigfoot, uh, the Bermuda Triangle, right? Uh, all kinds of things. Um, and you should have a, a, a sort of rough idea of how parapsychology emerged and began to decline. I think we have a better idea of how it emerged. We'll see more about how it began to decline in a few weeks after we've talked about the uncanny. But in any case, we've seen today that it began as an attempt to establish a new branch of experimental psychology, which is a laudable effort. 
Um, and initially it tried to be as scientific as possible. It eschewed the study of ghosts, life after death, hauntings, and other supernatural phenomena and focused solely on psi or psychical phenomena, right? Now, uh, did it work? Not really. Um, and the main problem is due to replication. Uh, there are some notable cases of fraud, absolutely. But uh, most of the problems parapsychology suffered from toward the end of its heyday, I would say, were method methodological or to do with replication. Um, now, uh, a lot of uh, the a lot of uh, scientists, social scientists or natural scientists, are very skeptical about the purported findings of parapsychology. A lot of scientists adopt a view that aligns either with metaphysical or methodological naturalism. If not one, then certainly the other. Even those who aren't met metaphysical naturalists, like, uh, what's a good example? Like the, um, the papal astronomer, right? The Vatican has an astronomer, like, the, like where the Pope lives, the Catholics. They pay an astronomer. He's their guy, and he... Um, you know, he observes the sky, he does astronomy, he, he notes like, oh, when this full, this new moon begins at exactly this time, so there's Easter and, uh, and they also have these astronomers for, for religions uh, that have lunar calendars, like, uh, like, like in Judaism and Islam. So uh, now they're naturalists, but they're methodological naturalists. You know, the guy at the Vatican, he's, he's Catholic. He believes in God and everything and does all the stuff he's supposed to do, goes to mass, but he's just a methodological naturalist. Uh, so some are just that and some are full on metaphysical naturalists. It's all good, but that's just where most scientists probably sit. And as we get further into the course, we'll see that parapsychology wants to be a science, but it doesn't want to be naturalistic. And that's a problem because science is about the natural world, right? Now, I think parapsychology ought to be replaced by abnormal psychology, which does not abandon the principles of naturalism that were abandoned by some parapsychologists. And we'll learn more about that later. So for next time, before we dive deeper into parapsychology by looking at ESP and PK, let's talk about the uncanny. It's going to be fun. Uncanny situations um, or persons or events could be described as weird, eerie, creepy, or frightening. These are often the ways we might describe an encounter with the paranormal. If you have an experience of alien abduction or an encounter with a ghost, even if there's a natural explanation for it, and there are, as we will see as we make our way through this class, you'll still probably find it quite frightening and creepy and weird or any number of other things, right? So let's learn about the uncanny to get, in, uh, to get a sense of the emotional responses we have towards the kinds of things that might be considered paranormal and uh, animacy and mentation, which I will show you as we proceed are huge factors in anomalous or paranormal experiences. Oh, my computer's shaking. Must be a ghost, huh? Uh, so for next time, I've got all these readings already posted on Brightspace, but what I would like you to do is read Yench's paper. It's not very long. It's called the, On the Psychology of the Uncanny. And I'd like you to at least, if you don't finish Hoffman, try and get started. And again, you might want to wait until the evening. Maybe if it rains later, crack a window, light a candle, um, uh, and, and read The Sandman. It's, uh, it's not frightening, but it's eerie. It's like super eerie. I'll go through the story next time and summarize everything, but it's a cool story. So that's it for now. I think that's the end of my slideshow. Yes. So uh, my computer's slow. So we'll stop sharing the screen. And uh, I guess that's it. Um, I, uh, that's all for today. But if anyone has any questions, um, I'll take those now before, before we wrap up. OK. Oh. Looks like everybody's good question-wise. 
All right, everybody. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot. This was, oh, you have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, really quickly. Um, by the way, it was really nice to meet everybody today. Um, for the quizzes, I was just wondering, um, are they going to be just based off of the week that we uh, learned the material? So, yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, I, I think that uh, what I will do is have um, each quiz will be just on everything before. And then the next quiz will be on everything before that quiz up to the previous quiz. Um, and again, it's not going to be super difficult. It's just to sort of like keep uh, keep keep key terms and concepts in mind. So. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so uh, uh, Jenna, I'll talk. Yeah, I'll talk to you in a second after class. Uh, Rebecca. Oh, simulation theory. Well, I'll just say I don't think we live in a simulation. But also, in a way, your brain is also kind of like a reality simulator in your in your skull, right? So, but 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 that's not simulation theory. Yeah. So I'd say I I I am I suspicious of um, simulation theory. Uh, and the quiz, the quiz is going to be from both. So uh, lecture slides and readings. So definitely, and any, anything, anything could be fair game, readings, uh, anything like that. So, okay. All right. All right, thanks everybody. I'll see you all on Thursday. Bye.